is that word of prayer. Dear gracious God, we thank you, Lord, for another evening. You kept us, O oh God, since last Sunday, O oh God. We have no idea what things have befallen us or could have befallen us, but you've been gracious, O oh Lord, and you've been kind, and your shade upon the right hand has been faithful, Lord. We thank you for tonight, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, for this gathering together. We pray, Lord, you'll bless those who are here. Those who are here on time, O oh God, give them a double blessing, O oh Lord. Let their cup be overflowing down to the brims, O oh Lord. We pray, Lord, for those who are on the way, give them a safe passage. Bless those of God tonight who are here not feeling well, Lord. Those who are here with different problems, we ask God you'll take away those problems right now. That you'll let us focus strictly on your word, O Lord, and take away the hurts, the pains, the aches, whatever discomfort might be going through, O Lord. We ask God to alleviate it right now. We pray, Lord, as always, that you give us here to hear your word, to believe what's spoken to us, O God, and to hold fast to O God. We know we're in the stretch run. It's going to be a tough time. But your word has given us strength each week and given us power. We pray, Lord, to continue to evermore. Give us this bread. And give us your prayer. Amen. Turn to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Luke 14. Luke 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, we came across an old, familiar passage Sunday, and it ended up being the message, which I was totally surprised. That message Sunday morning went in another direction I expected to go in completely. The Lord just spoke, basically, which I'm always glad for. But in Luke 21, verse 16, a sobering truth here. Make some glasses. And he shall be betrayed both by parents, brethren, kinfolk, friends. Bottom line is, don't be surprised when it happens. The word he uses is not maybe, shall be. You shall be. It's going to happen. You might see the moth kind of knocking down. Some of you now really hit him. Okay? Got operation. And some of you, I'm going to pitch the clean them. I've got a big fog in front of my eyes. can't see anything. When do you guys get around to it? <laughs> and some of you shall be caused to be put to death. Death. Death causers. Now, this is before that period of time where the scripture says, and because iniquity shall abound, the love many shall wax cold. It's before that period of time. This is going to happen before that happens. It's going to be a tough day. They're going to get their big moment to turn you in. They're going to cash in on it. Now, let's go back and review an old truth in Luke chapter 14. I want to plunge right into the issue, but I want to, there's too much good stuff in this chapter to pass up. I got a good hour. Let's go through it. Verse one. And it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. I need this pause here. I guess I'm supposed to go ahead and start here. You are being watched always. They're not watching you for an example. They're watching you so they can find fault. Okay? Jesus had that entourage with them all the time. Imagine that. Every time you went and did something, somebody's watching you, looking for something wrong. 
There was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? I like this about Jesus. And we take it as an example. You in the days ahead are going to go on offense. It's going to get to the point of, you look at the early part of the gospel. Jesus is on defense. They're hitting him with the question. The latter part of the gospel, he turns the tables and he hits them with the question. What's the latter part? And it's no longer necessary to defend yourself anymore. It's time for you to take the aggressive move and be on offense. And you take the fight to them. All right? Quite a question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? What's their answer? And they held their peace. <laughs> it's funny how people who can start trouble get real quiet when you bring trouble back to them. And he took him and healed him and let him go. And answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fall into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. Two questions. He's batting 100%. percent zero, 0 And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying to them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, we got a wedding coming up, here's good, good advice. Sit not down in the highest room. Okay? <laughs> Just don't do it. Always make your way to the least table available and to the lowest room, the most inconspicuous place. This is Jesus' protocol. Emily Post wrote a book of etiquette. This succeeds hers. She doesn't address this issue in her book. Lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say unto thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. <laughs> Anybody ever go to a ball game or to an event like that where you have a signed seating? I did in New York one time. I went to the New York Mets game and sat down, and my seats were for the bleachers. I had a I was in the Navy, and they gave us these sailor passes. We got in freeway to sit in the bleachers out in center field. But it's kind of a sparse crowd that day. So I, as the game went on, I kept making my way around the stadium, you know, coming down lower. And finally, I was behind home plate. It was the fifth inning, and I had it made. And pretty soon, the usher came and tapped me on the shoulder. There's a guy standing behind me with his wife and his kid. And they said, you're in our seat. All right. They said, may I see your ticket, please? I asked him my ticket. Mine says bleachers. And he told me, he asked me if I'd like to be escorted. To my seat. I was so embarrassed. I said, I said, no, the Mets are losing. I think I just go home, you know. And I left, I left the stadium. I didn't want to leave, but it was too hard to walk clear back around that stadium again to go to the bleachers. This is what he's saying here. And thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, friend, go higher. That's a good feeling. And somebody says, oh, wait a minute, no, you come, you come in here, all right? And when that happens, everybody notices it. They get to the lower room and say, oh, you're in the wrong seat. You know, and they take you out the lowest room, and all of a sudden they start escorting you. And the whole room looks at you like you're somebody, and you may not even get to the top room. But the fact that you're escorted out of the smaller room, you become instantly somebody. He may send to thee, friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. They're looking and say, oh, there was somebody. But they're not at our table anymore. For whosoever exalted himself shall be abased. Now, the issue here, I have another eraser somewhere that doesn't mess with the board quite as bad. And that's good to get a new board next week. The issue here is simple. Do it yourself. 
One of the biggest problems that God has with us when he saves us, the biggest problem we have, period, as sinners, is ego. Me. Self. I. That's our biggest problem. And when God saves us, what he immediately starts doing is starts breaking us down. And he's got so many ways to do it. It's incredible. You've all experienced it, haven't you? I think I told you guys a story about that time. My wife and I went shopping. Went to get some shoes. At the church one Sunday. You know when you were a kid, you used to wear some, the old shoes into the store? And they put the new shoes on you? It was a big deal when your parents had to wear the new shoes home. You know? You always want to do that. You usually didn't get a chance to, but you know. Once in a while, you could wear the new ones home. Usually if they were tennis shoes. Fresh shoes never could. All right? But you always wanted to wear them right then. All right? And... I got this new pair of shoes, all ready to go. Got two pair of shoes that day. And all ready to go. I took my old shoes and threw them in the trash can in the store. It wasn't a trash can. It was one of these big barrels, right? Threw in the barrel. Then someone brought the credit card, and so it didn't go through. I had the new shoes on. I'm going to wear them out. And they came to us and said, I'm sorry, sir, but, you know, there's been a problem, blah, 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 okay? So I got to sit down and I'll lace my new, brand new shoes and put them back in the box. Then I got to get in this barrel, this big barrel. It's too deep to go into because it's the bottom. So I had to turn the barrel over on the side and get in there, crawl down and get my shoes out and put them back on. <laughs> That's what the maid come down there at Baldwin Hills, all right? The Lord has all kind of ways to obey us. <laughs> so he says what? Whosoever exalted himself shall be abased. He's going to do it one way or another. And he that humbled himself shall be exalted. The key word is humble yourself. Just do it. All right. Then said he also to him that bade him, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, don't call your friend. Now we're all in violation of that one, aren't we? Nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, Know their rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. What they call in the world, I owe you one. He says, invite the folks that you can't, they can't ever owe you one. Period. All right? But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed. The lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed. Now you never hear the blessing preachers preach that, do you? The key to blessing and prosperity: find the poorest folks you know and feed them. Thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Another great truth: how much blessing and prosperity? is preached as here and now. Jesus never preached that message. Now somebody say right away if you're Bible sharp, you'll say, well, he did say that a person who becomes my disciple will have land, houses, 100 fold, here, and the world to come. Correct? Okay, now, how many of you are his disciples? How many have more than five houses? Four. Three. <laughs> Nobody has this. But you know it. It's not what he meant at all. He's talking about the actual possession. He's talking about the fact of this. Remember the key commandment that he gave us to love one another. And if we really take those words seriously and execute that, everybody who has a house so is everybody else. How many people are there in the kingdom of God? I don't know. At least a hundred folk. At least a thousand. Right? A child of God really never should be homeless. 
on the real side. That's what Jesus was saying. Okay. He says, by this shall all men know. How will they know? Because when one doesn't have a house, he does. Right? All right, let's go through this chapter. You know, I didn't write this. Okay. What verse am I in? 14. 15 now. And when one of them that said and meet with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. That's the true thing. It's not at all here and now. It's over there. What did he say in verse 14? He shall be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Over there is payday. Satan's ministers are preaching the payday here and now. To the exclusion of over there. Jesus said it's going to be over there you get paid. Now here's what I want to get to. They said unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. We're going to hear that call real soon. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. Now that's the sad part. The killer of this text is that it wasn't until all things were ready that the excuses began to fly. A lot of folks miss their invitation. They don't even know it yet. Nothing's worse than being invited to something and have made an excuse and don't know that your excuse has been accepted. Okay? An invitation went out. The Lord announced the time of his coming. And many just shined it on. Some of you, when he announced the time was coming, some of you, many of you who are here, began at that moment to prepare for his arrival. You're still in that process, right? I mean, you never dreamed, I didn't dream, that when many of you came here around April of 1997, that you would still be here in August of 2000. Did you? So had I known it was going to be this long, I might have done something different. That's what these folks are saying. They're making all the plans now. This is the excuses. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Lame. Who would buy property without seeing it first? This guy did. I have bought a piece of ground. I must know. I, I must go see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, "I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them." Again, lame. Why didn't you prove them before you bought them? Right? Let's make excuses. Okay. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, "I have married a wife. Now you got a good reason, right?" <laughs> And therefore, I cannot come. My only question about this story here, this guy here, is that he just couldn't come because of the marriage, or she said he couldn't go, you know? <laughs> They're the hot they want, Robert. <laughs> I'll be calling the church next week, next month, and saying, I can't make it tonight. I'll say, why not? You can't make it, or Pastor, you can't go. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be home cheering his wife up, huh? <laughs> so, that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city. All right, first part. First invitation, I'm going to tell you who it's to. It's the church members. You don't normally invite range into a wedding. You invite family and friends. Okay? This went to the saints. First invitation. And the ones who made excuse were the saints. 
That's why I keep saying so many times. You're going to be surprised who's in heaven when you get there. And more surprised who's not going to be there. Second invitation goes out. He says, go up. Go quickly into the streets and lanes of the city. Key word here is quickly. Why? Time's up. All things are ready. And a cook will tell you, nothing makes a cook any more aggravated than a fixing meal. And it's all ready. And the folks can come to eat. That makes any woman I know mad. Right? Quickly. So I says, go into the street and lane. Who do you know there? Nobody? We're getting the strangers now. This isn't in the Bible just for fun. God is teaching the real truth here. He's saying the church that I invited to my supper ain't going to make it. And they're going to make it because they have excuses not to go. I thought it was a miracle Sunday morning, in case you didn't catch it. When I said that God has brought that scripture up too many times about not forsaking the sinners themselves together. And he resurrected several times message Sunday morning. And at the end of the message, he dropped a bomb on me. And I said it such a way that he probably didn't think that he probably thought it was an understatement. I listened to the tape again. I said it so nonplus that you probably didn't pick it up. I said, God is wiping the past slate clean and saying that I'm going to give everybody another star from here on out. I thought that's marvelous. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I didn't do that. <laughs> Talk to my wife. She will tell you. I had written some off some time ago. To the point that I was ready to put some out. I've been there for a long time. Then the Lord comes and does something Sunday that gets me, gets me going. I said, well, you know, one thing about me and the Lord, I'll comply with them real quick. And I'll do that. You know, he, he says something, that's it. Okay? All of my feelings and everything, they go out the window as soon as the Lord speaks. But that's where I was at for the last year. Then God does this. Okay? That's a great grace in case you didn't pick it up. I admonish you to take advantage of it. Okay? Now he says, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. Interesting. Look at verse 13. When thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Same thing. Same thing. Who's going to be in heaven? The poor, the halt, the main and the blind. It's going to be full of kind of folks. Because those cool who could walk to church didn't come. And those who could see didn't see. And so he said, I'm a, he does a paradox. I'm going to bring those in who can't walk and save those who can't see. Just like God, isn't it? That's who he's going to save. My concern when I read these kind of scriptures is I don't want to lose my seat. Especially to somebody handicapped. <laughs> I have a problem with handicapped parking. Particularly UCLA. UCLA overdid it. Everything on UCLA is handicapped parking. All the streets in front of the buildings or anything, it's, it's a real, it's a real pain up there. A real problem. And I found out later on that the person in charge of parking is handicapped. I said, well, he certainly buttered his toast, right? <laughs> I got caught one time in a handicapped spot. It was Christmas time. So I pointed to the handicapped spot. The police car put it right behind me. He said, I, he said, if you sell the car, you're going to get a ticket. You like that, don't you? You know? He said, this is for handicapped people. And, you know, I had to say something back. <laughs> so, well, you know, officer, there's not a parking space in this entire lot. And therefore, I am handicapped. You know? He said, no problem. Show me your sticker. <laughs> <laughs> so I went home. Okay. Those kind of cases just go home. You know, you get embarrassed and look around for a spot. Everybody, you go to the store, everybody says, that's the guy the police made move out of the car. You, know, you, you go home, right? I went back home. And the Lord, and the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto his servant, go out into the highways and hedges. 
Number three. Now, streets and lanes, it's assumed that these people have places to live. Highways and hedges, they're homeless. One of the boonies, as they call them in the South, okay? Go out to the boonies. Get those people. This one here is the last call. Now, it shows a whole lot about God. Number one, it shows that God can save anybody. Number two, it shows very clearly that with God, there is no formula for getting saved. Whoever hears the invitation and accepts it, they're saved. Just that simple. Right? That's why he's doing business the last days. I've talked so many times to you about the 11th hour thing. This one still has me thinking. We're there. I know a time in church, somebody come in like Miriam or Darlene, or more recently, Phyllis and some of you, they had been taken through all kind of hoops in church to get them saved. Salvation is by faith. An event that we claim is unseen. Correct? I go to so many times that story about the paraplegic man that they let down through the roof. Remember that story? They opened up Peter's roof in his house and let the man down by ropes. Okay? Now, I mean, imagine the service if this roof began to be broken apart right now. See the plastic starting to drop down and hear noise on top there. I'm trying to teach a class and this is commotion going on. That's why we got a big hole in the roof. You look up and see the moon and the stars, and pretty soon this bed comes down, right in the middle of our class. All right? Jesus kept on teaching. Then the bed reached his floor. He walked up to the man. Said what? Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Did that man ask for forgiveness? No. You didn't get saved because you asked for it, by the way. You got saved because he offered it. Period. We, we, we go, we sing the song sometimes now. Um, something got a hold of me. Went to the meeting one night and my heart wasn't right and something got a hold of me. That's exactly what happened. Nobody went to church looking for Jesus. Went to church because your girlfriend went there. Or you're looking for one. <laughs> or your boyfriend went there. Or for some reason somebody asked to go to your mother. Nobody just went to church because I'm going to go find God. He tricked you. You went to church, the message went out, and the message grabbed your heart and captivated you, right? And you heard it, and sitting in your seat without an altar call, while the choir sung up in the background, you just believed, period. And probably even unknown to you at that time, you got saved. Now, if I was in the traditional church right now teaching this, I'd, get, I'd be getting stoned. You know that, don't you? The traditional church would be surprised to learn that Jesus didn't make any altar calls in church. Go to one of our standby scriptures, St. John, chapter 8. I'm going to show you a typical salvation scene in a church service of Jesus. Let's pick up at verse number 25. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning, I have many things to say and to judge of you. But he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of a father. Then said Jesus unto them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Go ahead. And He sent, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. As He spake these words, many believed on Him. 
Where did Jesus take time out and say, okay, now? Anybody in the balcony? Believe. He didn't do it. He never did it. What did he do? It says, as he spake these words, those who had an ear to hear believed right then. As they sat in their seat without any outward motion whatsoever. That salvation is purest form. It's like the paraplegic man again. The man lays there. Jesus walked up to the man and says, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And what did the church do? <sighs> they wanted proof. Give us a sign. What evidence is there? And he said, That's what they did. They did the same thing back in that day the church doesn't say. We want proof. How do we know they're saved? I'll tell the pastor and the preacher the way you know is that they come back and hear God's word some more. And they come back again and again and again and again. And at some point, whether it's the initial time or the second return, I don't know when it is. But at some point, salvation takes place because we know for sure the Bible says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, and neither can he know them because they're spiritually understood. At some point, that person changed from a natural man to a spiritual man because they begin to receive the things of God. How does it happen? I don't know. Tell me how a child gets born again. How, how, how conception takes place. It's a mystery. The mystery of the seed. Any farmer will tell you. You take a seed... I think most of you had experience planting some kind of seed. If nothing else, then in school when you plant a flower seed. Seeds are hard. You take this hard seed, you drop it in the ground. And if you dug it up a few days, a week or so later, it rot. It's rotten. It decays. Don't smell it. Okay? Has a terrible odor to it. It dies. Jesus gives an illustration that supper corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies. Okay? It's a mystery. You put something in the ground hard, it goes through a process, it dies, becomes like a liquid, and then sprouts forth a new life. A plant comes up. In the case of corn, you plant two little kernels of corn, put them in the ground. The law is knee high by the 4th of July. Comes up, before you know it, this time of the year, and it's September, it starts having ears on it. One corn plant will yield seven, eight, ten ears. And it'll keep on bearing ears until the falls kills it. And each one of those ears has hundreds of these kernels on it. Like Paul said, what comes up is just like what goes down. This here is a glorified body. This is a natural body. It is sown a natural body. It is resurrected spiritual body. Your spiritual body is going to be so much more magnificent than this natural one is. You're going to have eyes like you have now, but the vision will be like that of an eagle. You'll see far better. And these things here be a thing in the past. No more eye doctors. No glasses. No more contact lenses. No more dentist visits. No chiropractors. None of that stuff anymore. In a land that you'll never grow old with the perfect body that's far superior to the body that you have now. Won't that be something? I told him I'll preach a message about heaven pretty soon. That's a part of it, okay? The man lays there on the floor on his little pallet. The church says, how do we know? And without them asking the question out loud, Jesus read their thoughts. What did he say? He says, so that you will know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. I said to the sick of the palsy, take up your bed and walk. Now he proves it. Their logic was, if the man is sick, he has to be a sinner. So if Jesus said your sins are forgiven, that's gone. If that's true, he should no longer be sick. So to prove the point and answer the question in your mind, he says, do what? Take your bed up and walk. In fact, he says, take up your bed and go home. He even asked the guy for a praise offering or for a praise period. He says, take up your bed and go home. Imagine coming to church to get healed by Jesus and walk out saved. He got what he bargained for. 
There's nothing can say. Again, it shows that salvation is not our choice. It's God's choice. Here's the case where you say somebody never heard the message. That's the, that's the case of saving a drop-in. Literally. Drops in, saves him, he can go home now. Take it to bed, rise up, go home. Well, how do we know he's saved? Because he walked. What's the spiritual analogy to it? I'm going to spiritualize it, which I think I have a license to in this case, or to allegorize it. Anybody who gets saved by faith in an unseen situation, given time, they will rise to walk in the newness of life. Period. The problem is the church puts a time frame on them. That's the problem. They expect them to become new today. Right? We've been on a story this world before. I know I'm going here again tonight, but I guess it's time. Don't ask me. Okay? We expect them to start acting like saints today. We forget, particularly preachers, that that person who's born again right then is a baby in the Lord. Now, who demand their one day old baby to start walking? What kind of mother would do that? What kind of mother expects her one day old baby to start crawling? Or even to turn over? Or even to raise his head? You would expect that, wouldn't you? Those things take time, right? One day you walk to the, to the room and you know, the baby's in the stomach and trying to lift his head up. And you drop down and they go through that procedure for a while. Then you take me stamp on your, stamp on your, on your lap. And they'll stamp for a minute, they straighten up and then they collapse again. And that goes on and on and on, right? And the baby's loving it. They get up when they get excited and they're you know, standing there. I was like, <laughs> can't walk him yet. A baby in the Lord is the same way. But, that baby that is born, it does not get a second supply of life after week six or one year or five years. It has all the part and all the breath it's going to ever need for the rest of its life. It is a new creature at that point. Just not mature yet, but brand new. So this group here in St. John, they believed on him, right? As he spake these words, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, many believe on him. Now, here's why I part company with the evangelistic preachers today. They all preach a message of salvation. They say, just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And they're right. They're right. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. True message. Salvation starts with believing. Why part company with the evangelists these days is that they stop there. Jesus didn't. What happens here? Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Why well, about these folks that believed in Jesus when they are at better yet? They say, accepted Christ as, you know the rest of it, their personal Savior. And never continued his word. What about them? They're not his. They're not his. That takes in a lot of people who call themselves saved today. I meet them all the time. They had a church experience. Five years ago, two years ago. Well, I know I got saved. Yeah, you did. I'll drop that. But what did Jesus, Jesus say? If you continue my word, then are my disciples indeed. And here's the greatest promise in the Bible, the most underrated promise. And you shall know the truth. What do you mean? All you got to do is continue to show up. And God's promise is that I will make you know the truth. All of it. And what? And the truth shall make you free from what John says. Turn to the first John now. Chapter 4.
It's a tricky world out there we're living in, this religious world. Verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. How can I get protection from all these false prophets? He tells you, verse 6, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. What do you mean? He says, whoever has believed God's word initially, they continue his word, they will hear us who continue to preach God's word. They'll hear it. And those who aren't born again won't hear us. Pretty simple, huh? Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of what? Error. If you continue my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free from the spirit of error. You cannot go astray. Good news, you agree? Now go back to Luke 14. Twenty-three. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them, urge them, to come in, that my house may be filled. He's gonna fill his house. Okay? For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. A big church that God gave, that God sent the announcement to. He said, come on. Maybe they didn't believe that it was an announcement. Right? You get a letter in the mail. I got an invitation. And if it's valid or not, it should have on it a postmark. That makes it authentic. You get that letter, and somewhere those stamps should be some lines should go across those stamps to void out that stamp. And it's going to be stamped on there by a post office that this has been officially received by the U.S. government and delivered to you. And the way most people do when they get something like that, then you check out what? The return address. Valid invitation. You see where it's from. When God sent his message about the rapture, the church never bothered to check out the return address. They never bothered to see who it came from. That's pretty sad. I mean, a wedding invitation does not look like any other invitation in the world. Wedding invitation and graduation invitation. They're a little special. And when you get one, unlike junk mail, you don't just throw them in the trash. They're usually handwritten most of the time, right? And you look at it. Somebody takes the time to write your name out. What do you do? You open it. This is especially endorsed to me, right? And I get some mail. Occupant, I don't read that. To the door of apartment four, I don't open that. Because they don't know who I am. And I don't want to know who they are. I figured they live, I live without them this long. They didn't know me, so I threw them in the trash. <laughs> Automatic. Okay? Then some mail you get, it has my name on it. So I check the return address then. The ones I can't stand is the return address of the post office box. That's usually a bill. Usually Fort Lauderdale, Florida. <laughs> Must be the building capital of the world. Okay? But if it's a return that I email. Everybody has a computer? That's one of the orders of the day. You go to your email box, right? Come back from vacation. There are 87 messages in my email box. Well, I know but there are not 87 people that I even do business with corresponding wise. Most of you, most people are right back and forth in the church. All right? Unless the church grew, I was gone. That never happened. Okay? So right away, what do you do? You got to go to boxes, right? Block, sender, delete. I need to check all of them. Both sides. I know of 87 messages I'm going to delete about 65. Uh -uh. And you get up to the ones that are really important. The names have names on them, you know? Robert, 
Miriam, Glenn, Dolores. Those, you know, I say for the last, because they're all, well, I'm going to read. Give it all the junk mail first, right? The church treated the announcement from God as junk mail. And what did he say? That's in that context there. I say unto you that none of those men which were bitten shall taste of my supper. Because they never read my, they, they never about to read my announcement. They never about to check out if this message came from me or not. This is either, uh, we'll see. Verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. That's the tough part of discipleship. Now we're connecting this with what we read back in Luke 21. He shall be betrayed by parents, brethren, kinfolk, and friends. Now we see now why Jesus made a stipulation up front. What did he say? If any man come to me and hate not. Now, does he mean that you're supposed to hate your father, mother, sister, brother? No, not at all. Jesus preached love. But, he's saying when it comes down to a choice between me and them, you're to act like you hate them. That's what he's saying. He said, either I am all, first, everything, or don't be my disciple. Don't be my disciple. That's the tough part about discipleship. He demands all. Right? We get baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, many of them baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Right? To get baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, automatically I'm taking the role then as a slave. He owns me. Period. As far as he's concerned, I don't have a mother anymore. Or a father. Or a wife. Or children. A lot of folks aren't going to go to heaven because of these family ties. You know that? And Satan really begins to promote family ties or gets concerned about family ties when it comes down, down to Christ. He gets real concerned about, about family all of a sudden. It's amazing. You can go to a false church all your life. The whole family can go or nobody can go. And Satan won't bother them. But let one person find the truth and continue the truth and all of a sudden, Satan resurrects all these different factions here, and they become a problem in their life. You got that, Shirley? Now I take it further. And whosoever does not bear his cross. His very own personal cross. And come after me. It's two part in there. You can bear your cross and never follow Jesus. Michael looks amazed on that one. I'm amazed too, Michael, for some in, in the word. Hope the Lord gives an explanation for it. Two stage. Whoso does not bear his cross, number one, let's break it down. Bear cross until come after me. Do you know that there are people who are bearing the cross and not following Jesus? This one, the tactics we studied a few months ago of the flesh. They're going through all the strenuous rigors of Christianity and the headache of being looking like the saved but ain't following Jesus. It's like that story I put in a bulletin a long time ago when you used to have a bulletin about this man they picked up on the road. He was 
walking down the road, carrying this huge sack of, sack of potatoes, 100 pound of potatoes. So the guy pulls up beside him and says, you want to ride? He says, sure. He says, hop up into the back of the truck there. So the guy hops in the back of the truck with his sack of potatoes and puts them on his lap. Now there's plenty of room in the truck to lay him down, but he carried them on his lap. So the guy said, look, you can lay your potatoes down if you want to. You know, there's no problem. You ain't got to carry them. No, that's no problem. He says, thanks for the ride, but I'll just carry my potatoes, all right? It's called being humble. God don't want that. When he picks you up, he expects to lay your burdens down. And then do what? Come after me. Now, there's a message I've been trying to preach for the last four, five Sundays. Haven't got to it yet. When we go back to Exodus 33, after the golden calf incident, it said they took the tabernacle and moved it far from the camp. Okay? And it ties into Hebrews where it says that Christ suffered outside the gate, and those who are following Christ must go outside the gate bearing his reproach. You can pick up a cross and call yourself a Christian, which a lot of folks do, but they never bear the reproach of following Christ. And that's the difference. They you can identify with him. They took on the name, but never upon the burden and the persecution and the tribulation that goes with following Christ. They stood afar off. Never followed him. Now it gets deeper. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient? What's he saying here to us? He's saying that discipleship is not something you take on lightly. You count the cost. When it comes to salvation, you can come without money. You can come freely. But if you intend to follow Jesus to the end, it's going to cost you everything you got. Good. Right down to what God said in our present message right now. He said it may very well cost you your Life. What do he say? For your parents, brethren, kinfolks, and friends shall cause you to be put to death. Now when that happens, when the pressure gets that tight, will you then make friends with your family and your kinfolks and your friends and parents and save your life? A lot of them go back. There's another statement I looked up tonight before I came in, but it's just come to my mind just now. So the Lord is going to give it to us. It says, a person who puts his hand to a plow and looks back. He says, he's not fit for the kingdom of God. Now, they're not going back. They're just walking forward, looking back. But it brings to mind who? Lot's wife. She didn't go back towards Sodom and Gomorrah. She was walking out of the city, being delivered by the Lord, and just looked back. At that moment, you know, she froze. What's God telling you? He said, you look back, you're frozen. It's over. Your forward progress stops at that point. He said, that person cannot, cannot be my disciple. He expects you to have head straight ahead and following him wherever he goes, you're gone. Simple, right? Count the cost. Whether you have sufficient to finish it. Now that's why I'm going to deal with that part because I want to get to this other part tonight. First Corinthians chapter 10. I've been trying to get to for the last two Bible classes. And the last two Sundays. I haven't found enough time to make it. You've been a real good audience in the heat tonight. Now, 1 Corinthians 10, you know what verse 13. There is no temptation. That's the word. Temptation. Now, sometimes you say, well, like temptation, you wonder exactly what is God talking about. Because so many different varieties and forms of temptation. Okay? What you want to do when you're studying this, just some advice for those of you who study on your own. I hope all of you do. I know all of you don't, but for those who do. Number one, my advice is to get yourself 
a strong concordance. Would you get my concordance, please? Should be right on top of this. And if anybody's interested in trading concordance with me tonight, you bring your Sunday and you can trade with me, okay? I'm going to trade in tonight. Yeah. You got one to trade? You want to trade yours? Anyone? Anyone? My strong support. The new, strong, exhaustive concordance of the Bible. This might be my third one. Okay? But it's the best Bible tool you can possibly have. It takes every word from the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, and the Greek is an exact, precise language. The scripture says that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. A big part of the timing of the birth of the Son of God had to do strictly with the language. Greek. What's so good about the Greek? It's about the most precise, accurate language ever spoken upon the face of the earth. Our English Bible, we lose a lot of it. For instance, there's a story. Show it to you, I've been here before. St. John 21. Now most people in the church belongs to know there's several words for the word love. Still there? Okay. Several words for the word love. There's ero. You get the word erotic from. There's filio, which is a brotherly love. The city of Philadelphia is called the city of brotherly love. Philo is your Greek prefix, brotherly. And then there's agape, selfless love. The way Christ loved the church. Here in Luke 21, or John 21, for instance, in verse number 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, love us thou me more than these. And he said to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Now in this English Bible, you miss it. You have the Greek text, if you get the concordance, it'll show you by the word breakdown. When Jesus asked that question, and Peter says, Jesus says, Peter, Agape thou me. And when Peter answered, Peter said, Lord, you know I feel you. I like you. But I love you. That's what a concordance gives you the advantage. It takes every word and gives you the exact, precise meaning of that word in that text. Next verse. He says to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me. The word here is agape. And what you say? And to him, yea, Lord. Thou knowest that I love thee. What does Peter say back to him? Peter says, you know, I like you. Philio, again, your English Bible does not break it down like that. Third time. He says to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And history really missed that. Because the third time, Jesus asked him the question, do you like me? And that's why you get a better understanding now. says, Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, lovest thou me? Now we think, reading from the English version, that Peter was upset because it was the third time Jesus said that. Peter was grieved because the third time Jesus asked the question, do you like me? And that's where a concordance gives you the inside track, all right? So that's number one. Get a good concordance, all right? Get a strong concordance. Only get one out there. Uh, Christmas time, you can buy in most bookstores for anywhere from $12, $14. The top price you're going to pay is 20 bucks. The best 20 bucks you've ever spent, right? Okay? Number two. Always look for the first reference for that particular word. Now look at the word temptation, all right? I said the question is, what does he mean when he talks about temptation here? Okay? Let's look at the first reference to the word temptation. 
Turn the song. 95. Let me ask you this before you get there. Why you going there? Is anybody surprised to find that the word temptation occurs for the very first time in the Bible, in the middle of the Bible? Nobody? Just me. I was shocked. I was shocked to find that the word temptation does not occur until you get halfway through the Bible. I thought it'd be, you know, maybe in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, you know, Job. Nowhere there. God keeps that word buried until he gets to a specific point. Psalms 95, verse 8. Harden not your heart. Now, all right, let's see how that word is used and what, and what format it's used in, what context. Here's a scripture we've been looking at many times. Harden not your heart, as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation. And said, it is a people that do err in their heart and have not known my ways. Unto whom I swear my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. I think with those kind of stakes writing on it, we don't understand the framework of temptation. You agree? Now, God says in his word, the first time he used it, he says when they tempted me and proved me. This word tempted means to put to the test. Now, I ask the question, how, remember, our subject still is idolatry, which is covetousness, right? The tripwire for the church in the last days. It's a wide subject, but God's going to give you a real narrow, pinpoint, rifle shot, crosshair scope shot tonight, right? To tempt him or to commit idolatry, which is covetousness, is real easy. Anytime they had an alternative way to do anything other than what God said, they are accused of tempting him. For instance, our first one we encountered so far, Moses went to the mountain 40 days, right? Up there talking with God. He delayed. It says that he saw that Moses was delayed to come out of the mountain, right? Do you know that once they decided he was delayed, that's when they began to tempt God right there? Because who are they to decide what a delay was with God? All they had to do was just wait. Correct? What did they do instead? We don't know what happened to Moses. Yeah, you do. You know he went to the mountain. And in the company of God, a God who just spoke to you out of that mountain. Right? You know where he's at. So we just wait till he comes back. And they decide, of course, you know, to make a golden calf and it's going to go in the name of the Lord without without Moses, all right? To tempt God is to go any other way or do any other thing except what God said to do. That is where idolatry, which is covetousness, comes into play. It is no longer his way, but becomes my way. I'll tell you guys who serious with this message. Remember when the rapture, mes rapture message took place? And the Lord told us that Sunday morning afterwards, he said that he's going to shake up a second time. I mean, I'm shaking. Remember that? He's going to shake out one more time before it's all over. He's getting us ready for that second shaking out is what he's doing. He gave us the formula already. Moses gave it to him at the Red Sea. The Red Sea said what? I'll give the first word. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Easy thing to do, right? Well, it's not that easy because Pharaoh's come to kill us. But on the real side, what could they do? Nothing. Right? So do what? Stand still. Now here's the case when all odds are against you. You're going to get taken out. Right? But it gives you a picture in the Old Testament of a promise in the New. The promise in the New Testament was what? That with the temptation, 
he will make a way to escape. Right? They're in a situation where there's no way out. The Red Sea in front of them, mountains on both sides, Pharaoh's coming behind them in the dark. And Moses gives them dumb advice and says, just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And that's exactly what God's going to expect us to do in the days ahead. So stand still and see the salvation. And don't even think about how you're going to get out of it. Then at the last minute that night, it says what? The Lord brought a strong east wind and opened the sea up. And this is what the New Testament says he'll do. Made a way of escape. A way, as they sing in the songs from the time of church, he made a way out of no way. And to really see the miracles, the thing that God's going to do, let me go back to one more scripture and end the class with this, and I'll get back to this part Sunday morning again. Turn to Joshua. Verse 5, chapter 1. Last part of verse 5. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. I promise. Verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Verse 7. Only be thou strong. Verse 9. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed. Dismay. That's the case that's out. Dismay. Dismay means that I'm sitting around and I'm wondering what is going to happen. And God said, don't even wonder about it. At the Red Sea, this was to stand there and just chill. Same old message, ain't it? What's the same old message? You guys said, mm-hmm, real quick, what is it? Cut down. Rest. Rest in the Lord. The Lord is going to kill us. You have to just rest. <laughs> the worst that can happen to you is what? They kill you. That's what's going to happen. They kill you. That's an express ticket to heaven. You agree? You're saved to die. So they come and kill you. And just stand still and do it. Those are the lucky ones. But for those who continue in God's word and know God's word and know his plan and been here right straight through, you shall be strong and do exploits and you shall be alive and remain to the coming of the Lord. You're going to get taken out. For you, he needs you. And for you, he's going to do what? Make a way that you might escape. What's the whole point of this message? The escape route, you can't see it. You can't figure it out. You can't begin to anticipate it. Who would have thought that night standing at the red sea is going to open up? As you think about ways out, who would imagine we're going to actually, you know, I can see many things in mind that we can build a boat or a dinghy or something, you know, get a big log and let's go out of here, okay? But who would have thought that God's going to open this thing up and we walk out on dry land to the Red Sea? Now, the scripture I'm looking for, I didn't find early here in Joshua. I want to tell you, everybody close your Bible. Particularly you, Lord. I'm going to tell you the scripture. And if I tell you what it is, somebody's going to start looking for it and you're going to miss what I got to say. God said to Joshua, you can look at something to get home. I will show you wonder. He also said to them what? You have not passed this way before. First time. We're about to go up on an adventure with God that we have never passed this way before. Ever. Come up. God's going to ready for that. That's all he's doing. Okay? He cannot show you the wonders unless you sit still and wait for them to happen. When God talks about that he will make a way of escape, you're talking about the God of the universe who created the universe. How diversified are his escape routes? What can he do? How can his, here's where scripture really applies, that his ways are past finding out. You can't figure out his escape ways. 
Moses had no idea they're going to walk in the Red Sea. He probably felt pretty stupid when God said, stretch your route out, route out over the sea. What did that look like? Imagine. You got 600,000 armchair quarterbacks behind you, complaining. You're in the dark, and then the Lord tells you to do this, and they take a stick and stretch out over the sea. That crowd is yelling, do something. I'm going to tell you, in your mind, going to be the same thing. The flesh is going to say, do something. And we've been creatures of doing things. We're going to want to do something. And God's saying, don't do anything. I will make a way to escape for you. We've got to trust God's word. Period. And God's saying, trust it. He says in the New Testament, Take no thought. He means just that literally. Don't think about it. Neither be thou dismayed. Don't trip in your head. What you gonna do? If you haven't figured out by now about the way the messages are going, that something's coming down real soon, you're missing the whole point. These aren't, you know, academic exercises we have here in class. God is getting ready for a real deal. He told us this is the final installment of a rapture message before he takes us out. We already learned that we're not going to just walk out of here. He's, made, he's preached that so many times. Now what God's beginning to do is give you the details of what's going to take place and how he's going to keep you through this period of time. He lets you know if you're going to get taken out of the He's listening. He told you he's going to do it. Well, been a surprise. Parents, brethren, kinfolk, friends, they're going to sell you out. Those who get put to death, you have to wonder how this happened. Look at those categories. And I'm going to tell you right now, you'll be able to know who did it. Okay? All you got to look at who's doing it to you now. Who's your biggest opposition now in your life? Of your parents or your kin folks or your friends, so on and so forth. If you don't have any, you will. They're going to just arise. Okay? Not to tempt God means just do what God said. Period. If it's taking God 40 days, we're to stand still. He decides this way. I mean, he said, you're going to go without him. Right? Every time he said, they did what? They took and tempted me, tried me, and put me on trial. He's trying us. And he only wants people to go to heaven who are, anybody read the Daily Word a couple days ago? A profound statement came out in that message. So that God only wants people who are going to take his word. That's why he's saving. He does not want, I think I wrote in that message, the miracle mongers, the, 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 the wonder seekers, and so on and so forth, those reward people. Because I'm going to tell you right now, as the drama unfolds, he's not going to show you a single sign. Israel did not see one single sign until the Red Sea parted. The first sign they saw was their escape. Other than that, they're standing there waiting for the death to come upon them from the back in the dark, and they had no other alternative. First sign, the escape sign. You have to wonder when God's trying to escape. You'll know. You have to, nobody had to be, you know, a rocket scientist to figure out the Red Sea was parting. There's something unusual that's happening here. You say, well, suppose I'm, I'm doing something, you know, and it's not what God shows. Believe me. You will not mistake the Red Sea parting. Okay? God's going to show you wonders. He's got some things to show us in the days ahead. They're going to be some wonder things. And the more you start knowing him, like Moses, after a while, he got smart. Moses, during that period of time, came to know God's ways. And he began to realize that, oh, that's how he does business. He puts them in this messy situation, takes to the brink of death, and then comes through. Water problem first time, right? Red Sea, too much water. Parts it, dries it up. We get to the desert, same problem, water problem, no water. We're about to die of thirst, what does he do? Break open a flint rock. Here comes water. I think the second time it happened, that's the flint rock, that's when Moses got smart. And Moses understood God's ways. After that, walking with God for Moses became truly an adventure. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm looking for the adventure of this thing coming up. I know I'm not ready yet because if I was ready, God would be giving these messages. It would be all over. So he's getting me ready. But I feel stronger now that I have my entire saved life walking with God. As far as meeting this last deal, I've been afraid of this of it. My biggest question has been, 
What's going to happen? How it's going to take place? How am I going to respond? Can I go through? Well, God's thinking very clear. Yeah, you can. I'm going to take you through. And each Sunday, I get a little bit stronger, a little bit stronger. And I know, though, that this strength that's building up is not just for strength's sake. It's going to, God's going to tap into every single scripture he's given us in the days ahead. And he's going to expect to stand his word. He's going to come through. He told me, he says, I will never leave you. I won't fail you. I won't forsake you. I'll go through with you to six troubles. And the seventh one, I'll be there. So, that's the word. All right? Okay. Offering time. I still haven't got nearly to where I'm supposed to be getting to. So, come Sunday morning, 9.30. Be here on time on 7, 9.30. Shirley. And I still ask you to pray for me that I might get this message out. It gets hard every Sunday. Let's all stand. Dear gracious God, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight, oh God. We can't even begin to think about giving you what is worth. All we can do, Lord, is just show you our appreciation and show your honor in our lives and what you mean to us, oh Lord, by bringing forth an offering as a request, oh God. We pray, Lord, tonight that you'll bless those who are giving. Those that want to give and don't have anything, Lord, you'll bless them that they'll have it the next time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.